Whoop, whoop. It's the sound of the police. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> Get to the chopper. It's a loud one. Damn. Wow. Yeah, that might actually be police. A white Ford Bronco. <laughs> <laughs> This is Hard Reset, a series about rebuilding our world from scratch. Hello, and welcome to the Hard Reset podcast. I'm Nicholas Tucker, and I'm here with Taylor Hamilton. Hi. We are the co-creators of Hard Reset, which is a show on Freethink where we like to explore ideas that allow us to rethink the world from scratch. This episode, we're going to be talking about MycoWorks, which we featured in one of our Hard Reset episodes. If you haven't seen it already, please look down in the description below and go ahead and give it a watch. It's a great episode, and it talks about how they're using things like mushrooms to grow a substitute or alternative to leather. We're joined today by Rob Chapman-Smith. Hi, I'm the editor-in-chief of Freethink. And Toby Morishano. Hey, I'm the community manager at Freethink. So I'm curious from your perspective, Taylor, why is this a hard reset? I think it's a hard reset from the standpoint of like what a mushroom can do and what we think about it for. And the whole notion that, you know, these things aren't just for eating, but that there is this whole root system that is actually can be transformed is super interesting. Obviously with faux leather, there's lots of different kinds of replacements for that that we already have. So I wouldn't say it's a hard reset on that. But I think the thing that is most interesting that we're getting towards in the end of the episode is just thinking about these materials that we used to wear and what they are and what the properties of them and thinking that like, it might be time for new types of materials and what can we make with all yeah. those. Yeah, it's really interesting because I think we have a lot of preconceived notions about mushrooms and fungus that, well, some some of them we eat, some of them are just poisonous and gross, and some of them are like grow in our food. And there's it's sort of icky to a lot of people, the idea that we might use these. But it is, in many ways, just as normal or natural as a lot of the other things are used to make fabrics or make uh, textiles. I mean... Or get high. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, we're <laughs> get high, right? One. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's no stranger than wearing an animal's skin on you, yes. which is also odd, as it turns out. Well, it's not that odd because so many people do it, right? Right. But then when you think about it, you're like, mm, why, are we, why are we still doing that? Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> which I think is really the interesting part of this. And I, I feel like this is this episode and the episode on lab-grown chicken are very similar in the way of, you know, there's like a product out there that is now as good, cheaper, has all these different options towards it. And yet, what are the cultural sticking points for why someone would continue to still want cow leather right. and not mushroom-based leather? Right. Where I think that this is actually different than lab-grown chicken is that you know, we worked at you know, a company known for doing industrial design and industrial designers really love precious materials woods and metals and most pretty much detests injection molded plastic most of the things that you're buying in the store are made of injection molded plastic and part of the reason that injection molded plastic really works for a lot of stuff is that you can make it into anything right. it has no form or personality it just can become anything and everything so it inherently is not very interesting as material other than it's super useful and it's super cheap right but the reason why we like things like metal and wood is that they age and that they're very different and whatnot. And so with this, you're just like, well, you know, if you can make it in a factory, you can control all these different variations. Like, uh, am I getting that, that thing that's special and that's really unique, right? Because if I'm going to go and spend $500 on a mycelium leather jacket, I want it to feel unique right. and all that. Now, where I think this company, my coworks, is doing things differently is that they're saying each of these sheets of mycelium that we make is going to be unique. Mm -hmm. That because this is still being grown from mycelium, that there's like a natural variation that is going to happen and that that is actually gives it that quality that I think we crave about cow leather that you can now have for mushroom leather. Yeah. I think there's also an underappreciated sci-fi angle to this. Whereas like some of our episodes, you know, if it's, you know, virtual reality or whatever, it like beats you over the head. Okay, this is clearly the Matrix or Ready Player One or whatever. But if you remember like sci-fi stories, you know, often like the twist will be like all the materials are grown with fungus or some other weird source. And sometimes we talk about also like, what if we had to rebuild our world on Mars? Well, we're not gonna bring cows to Mars, right? right. We're right. not gonna bring cotton plants to Mars. So how are we gonna do that? And this is actually 
one of those things. Well, when you think about it, you're like, yeah, you could really replace a lot of stuff that we take for granted, you know, maybe more efficiently, um, you know, with, with uh, mycelium. Yeah, and, and what's amazing is the, the key input is, is dirt or really compost, mm-hmm. and, you know, or things that are traditionally just waste products. Right. I and mean, you literally can turn poop into mushrooms pretty easily. <laughs> and that's kind of amazing that, like, we can take some of the most, like, dreaded refuse products, <laughs> like human feces, um, you know, process it, sterilize it, and do, you know, like, all these things. But then it becomes a substrate for making really valuable things. Mm-hmm. So if you're in, in Mars, so we use that example, like, we literally have my favorite animation, which is a, a guy in a space suit pooping. <laughs> <laughs> I think I saw that and instantly my heart grew three sizes when I saw that animation. But I just love the idea that like this can create a, a, a shortcut to a circular economy in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Part of me wonders in terms of adoption, and I'm curious what y'all think, is does there need to be like a specific outfit style that this material is made out of that would mm-hmm. push it? To being accepted, like I think about like track suits or like windbreakers, like they, like it's like a particular type of material that's used for those types of things. Hmm. Um, is there does this need to invent its own outfit in order for it to gain traction and have that sticking point? No, I think it just becomes a replacement that you don't even pay attention to, mm-hmm. right? So, do you own a pair of raw denim jeans? No, I don't. Right? Like, have you felt a pair of raw denim jeans? They suck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I'll get a lot of comments about just like a raw denim's a way to go. But like, you put those things on, you're like breaking them in for two years. Right. They're super rough. They're just like, it, and so the jeans that you're wearing are pretty much plastic now. Right. Right. They right. don't actually have that much like cotton in them anymore, but that's better, right? Like they feel nicer on your body. And so I think mycelium is going to do something similar to that where it's like, it's just replacing it and you don't, aren't even aware of it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, how often do you like, you know, sit in something like I don't look up what the material for this chair is, you know, right. like most of the things you're not even buying yourself or you're not really looking at what the source of the material is. And you want it to last. I mean, I think the seats in like a Tesla, for example, as my friend calls them, the cocaine white seats, (laughs) (laughs) that that leather, it's not leather, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's all, but it works better and you can spill like red wine and stuff on those seats and like, Mm -hmm. it just, it just works. Right. So how much does this cost relative to like other types of materials that people would use? So right now it's kind of a luxury good, right. but it's comparable to luxury good prices. And I think the idea is that as the scales, it'll become more and more affordable. But right now, because it is small scale, the price is up. And, and they're partnering with Hermes mm-hmm. and other luxury brands to create really cool bespoke pieces that are at that price point. So it is definitely more expensive than traditional leather at this point. But I think that's only a matter of time. I think that's just a matter of time and scale and adoption. The, I mean, the core technology of it, once you've put in that initial R&D, uh, you start to minimize those marginal costs of production and you can, you can make this very cheaply. Yeah, I mean, the thing to answer your question from before that I think will be interesting is like when you think about mycelium, what is it that comes to mind? And, and what is it gonna, that is gonna be the thing that comes to mind for consumers? Right. And how does that get translated from being like a luxury good to being more commonplace? So I think about the, what is it, the Jordan 6s, the ones that have the patent leather in them? Mm. Where, six rings? Yeah, yeah, where they were like, okay, we're gonna make these pair of Jordans, but we want them to feel like a tuxedo. Right. And so you're gonna have these like, what normally you use for a tuxedo shoe, which is patent leather, and then we're gonna apply it to these Jordans. And like, then you're starting to see like, patent leather, which is a luxury kind of associated with luxury products, right. start to become streetwear. And so what, what's mycelium for that? Well, the other thing I was, I was cheekily going to ask is like, does this need like a rapper to start talking about it? Like, <laughs> but for real, like what, yeah. like what is, is, is that a thing that needs to happen? And do we think we're far away from like a, uh, a person who sets fashion trends using something like this because they like it? Right. What rhymes with mycelium? <laughs> Helium? Yeah, helium yeah. does. <laughs> <laughs> For a white guy, it's a rhetorical question. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're Eminem. <laughs> and then we're here all day. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, like when you're asking like the rapper question, like a lot, so much of rap comes down to aspiration. Right. And they're obviously with like their Hermes partnership going for making this feel like a luxury good. But I actually don't know whether that is the thing that really 
breaks this. There are a lot of companies that are working on this, right? Right, in various forms and fashions. And so they're really trying to create, what is that new materials? It's its own category. It's not trying to replace leather, even though it is in some regards, but it's its own thing. So it's, you can have this in plastic or you can have this in vegan leather or you can have this in, you, you can pick. Yeah. And so it just becomes another ingredient. And where I think this company is particularly interesting is that, you know, it starts off in the world of fine art, right? You have this guy that is like making architectural pieces, you know, art pieces. They look like bricks and mm. these weird formations out of mycelium. And he's really pushing the material to the, like the limit. And so with that, you're just like, well, we've been so limited in how we think about a lot of these materials. What is it that mushrooms can do that has never been done before. Mm -hmm. So what did it feel like? Both like the ones that were on, you know, on the market and replacing leather and things like that were three dimensional in ways that leather hasn't been possible before. Yeah, I think, I mean, it felt like leather. Yeah, mm -hmm. it felt identical to leather. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to think I can tell the difference between like really fake leather and things like that. I don't know that I am that sophisticated as a, like a connoisseur of these things, mm -hmm. but it really did feel like very real leather. I was, I was, I was fooled and, and with some of the samples. I mean, some they're actually leaning into the more mushroomy texture where it has a, like a very different look. Mm -hmm. And some they're leaning into the more like uniform brown or black with that leather pattern uh, that's kind of a skin texture to it. Um, and so there's a, there's a huge spectrum across which they, they play around with the textures, but all of them had a real because it is, you know, a living thing. It had that feel of, mm. of like a living or mm. previously living thing. It had a really interesting organic feel to it. It felt very much like leather to me. And most people probably can't tell. I mean, I think about the diamond industry and mm. you used to have to mine a diamond out of like the earth and now they're making lab-grown diamonds where even someone that has like... <laughs> <laughs> is looking at it right. with a microscope can even tell the difference. Right. Well, well, that actually brings up a really interesting question because one of the things with diamonds is they're chemically those things are the same, the lab-grown right. ones and the ones in the ground. And chemically this is a little bit different than cow leather because, or other forms of leather because it's mushroom. But it brings up an interesting philosophical question to me, which is what is leather? actually. Right. You're saying it feels like leather. Is leather actually a texture in a way that you're treating something versus like it coming from a particular source mm. type of thing? And I'm curious. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the what we would call leather is a, a more of a product of the tanning and the processing after the fact than anything else. And, you know, suede feels very different from patent leather, which feels very different from all the other types of leather you might encounter. I mean, I've sat in those chairs where they have like the really smooth, supple leather, and then I've sat in like chairs where it's like really stiff. And like, I mean, like there's a huge variation within there and how much of that is the material and how much of that is the process. It's hard to say. So I think one of the things to your your question is just, you know, what a definition is. How do you, how do you, <laughs> how do you define definition? How do you define, how do you define definition? definition? How, do you, how do we define these things, right? And like categorize them. I like I the mean, way we close the loop on that. <laughs> see that? See that? Uh, but when I say the word phone, what comes to mind? Probably something that looks like an iPhone. Yeah. Right? And 10 years ago, you, or 20 years ago, you probably thought of not that. Yeah. Right? And what an iPhone is now is actually much more like a mini computer right. than a landline, but you know, it's just, a, it's just a phone now. And so things that have these material qualities where it feels buttery and it has this shine to it and this, like that will just be leather, I think. And whatever made it, however that got made, is gonna be kind of inconsequential. Right. I think there'll always be a place for like higher end leather and rawhide and all of these things where yeah. people who want to buy leather goods will be able to buy them, you know, as long as we're having beef and, and, and slaughtering cows and such. But yeah, I mean, for the 80% or whatever percent it is that you're just using for the texture and the yeah. qualities, then. Well, a lot of what people would look at and think uh, assume is leather is not leather. Mm -hmm. It's plastic. It's some sort of plastic substitute or fake leather already. Mm -hmm. And I think this is just a different alternative to leather. It's not meant to replace leather. And they, they're very transparent about that, that they don't want to replace leather. They want to, they just see a limitation to that scale. Because like you said, this is a byproduct of the cattle industry. This is a byproduct of beef production and other things. That is a limit to the amount of leather you can get. If we don't have that much meat being produced, we won't have that much leather because they're not going to have a bunch more cows just so they can have more leather because then what do you do with the leftover meat? Yeah, and if you're a manufacturer in this space, you want to be able to make whatever you want to make 
mm-hmm. however you want to make it. So I don't want to have seams in this, or mm-hmm. I don't want to have all these holes that come from like cow made leather. One of the things that they talked about was like the thickness and, you know, they're, they're making these things in a lab. So they're able to just like really hone in from the manufacturer's point of view, what this should actually look and feel like and not have all the different kinds of aberrations that come when you're, you know, getting these from slaughtered cows. Right. And what I find interesting is right now when you buy leather, you buy it by the, by, by the, the quantity they sell it isn't like halves of cows. So you're like, oh, I bought a half a cow of leather, you know. And so, <laughs> it's and not the metric system, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> uh, it's it's one tenth of a cow. You buy these half of a cow, and it literally is like the outline of a cow's body because that's where it came from. And it's, um, you know, like that's a huge limitation of this is like the size and dimensionality of it. And if you're trying to make like leather gloves, how many of that glove shape can you fit into that? is a real question of optimization, but what if you could just grow it just in that shape? Mm, If you're just making leather pants, can you make the leather pants pattern just in that shape with no waste, not having to trim this? You can, and that's one of the technologies that this allows, is that right now they're making these trays that are pretty much squares, but there's no reason they can shape the way it grows in any two-dimensional pattern, three-dimensional patterns, things like that. So you could grow a seamless leather coat or glove or any of these things. One of the things with this uh, show, we constantly talk about space and the ways that these technologies can impact our ability to live on uh, non-Earth planets and, right. and bodies. And I'm curious about the use of this type of technology in a, uh, in a circular economy that would have to be in exist on space in something like Mars or based on the moon. Yeah, so uh, that's a constant refrain for us when we're thinking about these things is, well, how would we rebuild up? a human settlement on another planet. We're not necessarily going to take cows with us, but we still need materials. I mean, clothing is a very early human technology. We've been doing this for tens of thousands of years, primarily with probably animal hides, and so that's very foundational to our existence. How do you start over without that as an input? Right. Uh, if you're building a base on Mars, you still need to be able to repair your clothing and make, make new spacesuits and be able to use um, the materials you have. And this, what I love about this technology is that it, its input can be pretty much the worst, right? It can just be like <laughs> fertilizer, right? You know, feces, garbage, compost. You can mix that together and sterilize it and then grow mushrooms in it that can turn that into really valuable molecules that you can use to make clothing, make other kind of materials. So it's it's sort of a perfect technology for space colonization. Yeah, and part of the reason that we always talk about space is also that we feel like we should be thinking about Earth as a giant spaceship a right. lot more. Because right. in a lot of ways, it is, right? And we need to, if anything, think much more about our entire planet and that we have a fixed amount of resources. And if we don't do it right, then... Um, Yeah, not good. (laughs) Did any of the folks at MyWorks talk about the implications in space and and are trying to talk to NASA about potentially doing something there? Not to my knowledge. I think uh, that was something that's... I I would say they're they're not as weird as me. (laughs) (laughs) Um, That's definitely something I think we started to think about internally. I don't remember us really talking about that. I think we may have mentioned it at some point in our calls. No, but I think part of the reason that we love talking about NASA and thinking about space so much is that, you know, they are on the frontier of thinking about materials and science and technology and like just that that aspect of it and how we can apply that back here. I mean, there's a video that Freethink did a few years ago on Icon, which is a company down in Texas that is 3D printing homes, right, right, made out of basically concrete. And they just got a big contract with NASA in order to do this on the moon, Mm -hmm. right? And that's super interesting, using moon dust in order to make structures that that are up there. So organizations like NASA is going to be thinking about what are the kinds of materials that we should be equipping the astronauts when we launch them off the Earth, but then also once they're in orbit, once they're actually on a planet or a moon, how do they sustain that? Yeah, I mean, it, the, the thing about the space stuff, too, and the reason why I think it's great for hard reset is, like, we're going back to the moon. Like, right. that, that is a thing that is going to be happening within the next decade, if not sooner. Mm-hmm. We're going to be going to Mars. These are plans that NASA has, and we are there's billions and billions of dollars being coordinated to that activity. It, it feels kind of under-celebrated as a thing that we're about to do again. Like, we haven't been back there since the 60s. Yeah. It, it's, it's nuts. And so... 
yeah, it's cool that all of this energy is happening and we get to tell, show the, some of the technologies that are going to be inputs into us just being a multi-planetary species again. <laughs> well, and I think one of the things that is also missed when we're talking about, you know, NASA spending $50 billion or whatever it yeah. is on Artemis is that when people say that, it sounds like they just lit the money on fire and just vanished, right? But it's like, no, that $50 billion went into different companies and organizations 100%. to like fuel a lot of super interesting research and projects. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. the net benefit for us living on Earth is tremendous. And we'll see those effects for decades, centuries. I mean, it, this is really profound. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, the, it's the only Gil Scott Herring song that I really don't like is the Whitey on the Moon song because it's like just so astronomically wrong. <laughs> like, because so much technology has come from the space program. Most of them, uh, and just it's such a benefit that we can coordinate that scientific research in a cool way, go into space, go into other planets, and then you just get a whole bunch of downstream effects that help our daily lives. Yeah, without the moon landing, we wouldn't have developed the technology for sound stages and <laughs> Photoshop and <laughs> wow. all of these amazing technologies. Wow. 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 There you go. Uh, oh, whoa. whoa. <laughs> um, Kubrick fan over there. <laughs> I think it's very interesting. The most visible part mm -hmm. of the moon landing is a guy on the moon, right? Right. And I get the outrage of like, we spent so much money for that, mm -hmm. but we never see the invisible part of that, which is this massive investment in R&D that has, since the 60s, really just changed human life on Earth in so many ways. Yeah. Um, yeah, and if you haven't already, I highly recommend watching For All Mankind because they do a really good job of unpacking what that might have looked like if we hadn't sort of taken the gas off the space race in the, at the end of the 60s and kept up that pressure because, and they do a good job of exploring what alternate technology paths we might have led down, and how much more quickly we would have developed things like electric vehicles For sure. and things like that. So um, I'm excited to see us doing this again. And I think that this technology, while not a direct result of it, is certainly a something I'm sure organizations like NASA are looking at as potentials for creating sustainable manufacturing in space because you can't do it unsustainably in space. Right. You don't have the margin for error that an entire ecosystem provides you uh, when you're on planet Earth. Yeah, because the ecosystem in space is barren. <laughs> it's what you bring with you. Yeah. And it's both the biological one in terms of cows and stuff like that and the economic one. Yeah. Like you don't have factories to produce textiles and cut textiles and tailor them. Mm -hmm. But the idea that you could just like grow a pair of pants <laughs> like right. in that format with zero waste, you know, that's incredible. And the speed of it is incredible too. Like how long does it take for you to raise a cow <laughs> <laughs> from cow infancy to cow adulthood so that you can then kill it and take its skin. Mm -hmm. Granted, you get some other outputs that are useful, but there's a ton of inputs along the way where you constantly have to feed this thing. There's a huge timeline. How long does it take to grow a mushroom? Mm -hmm. And how, you know, how much more efficient is that if you're looking at these sorts of uh, material? Thinking about the hard reset super episode where we just blend all the technologies from all the episodes mm. together into one. Yeah, I like this. How would you grow mushrooms in space? Is it like a vertical farm type thing? Is it a horizontal farm type thing? What would you do? Yeah, so I, I've filmed on some mushroom farms in the past and literally mushroom farms that are almost 100 years old mm. uh, in upstate New York. And they are pretty much already vertical farms. Mm. Um, they're big barn looking structures. You go inside, it's very dark. They tightly control the light, the temperature. Uh, they keep everything very sterile. And they're usually the shelves of the, the growing substrate, which is primarily compost or manure and other fertilizers that have been steam sterilized so that they don't have bad bacteria in them that can contaminate the crop. But they are basically already vertical farms. They've been vertical farming for decades. So yeah, they've definitely been ahead of the curve. And if you need to go up, you just, you just float. Right. <laughs> In space, everything's a vertical farm. Yeah, exactly. And if it, and if you just oh my God, it, how do I go back down? <laughs> I'm curious, Toby, what kind of comments and questions we got from the audience. A lot of people were curious about the details of the process, like how exactly it works, you know, from a technical level. And... Um, any other materials that they might be able to generate from it, anything like that. 
Yeah, they were super proprietary. Yeah. They were very <laughs> private. Super secretive. There was speculative. Yeah. speculation yeah, like, about you that. You can't be back here. You can point your camera only at this. You don't point it this way. And part of that is that there are just like a lot of other companies that are in this space. They're trying to do this. And that's how you can always tell that something's going to be like the next big thing is that there's so much money and competition being put into this space. So right. they've been very sensitive about that. I think the big part of the technology that they really wanted to focus on was really the growing trays, mm -hmm. uh, which are these, you know, they're about this big, right? A uh, couple feet wide by a couple feet long. In the future, those trays could be much, much bigger and in different sizes other than just squares or rectangles. Yeah. Can you reverse engineer this? I mean, it's just organic material. You can break down the components of it pretty well, I figure. Like, yeah. I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a whole lot of secret about what types of fungus they're using to grow these materials. I think yeah. the w way they're controlling the conditions inside of these trays to get that result is what's proprietary. I think it's pretty well known what, or at least pretty fairly easy to guess what kind of mycelium they're using. I just think they need to like keep it private how they're able to get this exact result. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, the big thing that's going to be a differentiator is the quality of it and just being able to change the different characteristics right. around it. And then the quality control aspects, right? Like how many of these sheets like go sideways and you can't really use. And, Interesting. You know, with doing this stuff at scale, you know, having a failure rate of like 2% versus 5% is a really big deal. Right. And when they wouldn't let you into one of the rooms, you didn't hear any like screaming cows. <laughs> <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. No, um, there was nothing like that. It seemed, it didn't seem like there was anything untoward going on if that's what you're worried about. Uh, but no, it, it's, 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 I think it's just hard to patent some of these things and hard to enforce intellectual property when it's a process like that. So I think they're just very protective of the ways in which they're able to control and create these really consistent material streams. Different version of patent leather. Wow. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's all the time that's we have. amazing. Wow. <laughs> uh, we had a lot of questions. People were really curious about this. Uh, one of them was, how, I know we went into how durable it was with some of the tests, but generally, like, how did it act as a material? I mean, we know how leather works in general, and it's to some extent trying to replicate that, but there's also different kinds of leather, mm -hmm. and there's some potential for this to go beyond the capabilities of leather when you're talking about three-dimensional bricks or things like that. Right. So how was the feel of it, and how did it seem to perform as a material? Yeah, Nick, why don't you tell us about your obsession with torture devices? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it felt like leather. Like when you picked it up and held it, it felt very much like leather. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't feel like the plastic or other leather substitutes you might be familiar with. It felt very much like leather. It had a really natural feel, um, had a really... Softer. Yeah, very usually fairly soft. There were different qualities to it. Like they also have different levels of um, treatment that they are putting these things through to get different effects, different textures, different feels, and things like that. So by and large, it felt very much like like a very nice brand of like quality leather. I think there's a huge variation in what they can do. I don't know that they've fully explored that yet. There was a question um, actually from Mike Rossetti, our DP for the shoot, was asking if it's, would it be suitable for a motorcycle jacket? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I can answer that. I can't answer that. Mm -hmm. Because there are so many other like liability and safety issues that come for things like that with with uh, something you're using for safety. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an unanswered question as to whether or not this is as durable as something you'd want to protect yourself from like a motorcycle rack, the same way you would rely on leather for that. So those are unanswered questions at this point from my perspective. But it felt very much like leather, and it felt like you know like you could make a nice you know handbag or suitcase or other accessory out of it and never really feel that much different. Like you, you wouldn't be missing out on the quality of leather from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the lab where we spent a lot of time, they have a variety of tests. So the, the torture device that you know, we show in the opening shot of the dock is something where they're really testing like how, how much force can we use on this to pry it apart before it actually breaks. Yeah. So what other questions did the audience have? Uh, is this available now? I believe it is out on the market now. Uh, I believe most of their partnerships are with pretty exclusive brands. So I don't think this is something you can pick up at Target, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But I think it's only a matter of time before it starts to reach that market level. I think the, the prestige brands are going to wind up using this for prestige products that will then finance the creation of a larger scale operation to make this, I think, more accessible. Yeah, and there's a lot of players in the space. So you might have some leather that's not really leather, 
mm-hmm. that you're wearing right now, right? right? And I don't think that this is going to be one of these technologies where like it's big and shiny. And there's a huge new announcement, and Twitter goes crazy talking about it. <laughs> Just be something where like all of a sudden you buy it and find out later that it's made out of mushrooms. Right. Right. Are the alternatives to this? I mean, obviously we've had like pleather for a long time, but are they? mostly made out of mushrooms or are there a lot of different materials that people are experimenting well, with? Well, the like, alternatives are petroleum-based, right? So it's just plastic that is turned into leather. Yeah, it's probably the most prevalent one available. And, and like you said, it's been available for a while. We've been making plastic leather alternatives for a while. I think there may be some other work in, in biotech in terms of exploring new materials that are a little bit more nascent right now. But right now, I think it's most of the, the interesting and substantial work that I've seen has been in the mushroom space. Uh, what if people are allergic to fungus or mold? It sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I, I, I think there's no immediately addressable thing. There's, I mean, but there's also allergies to latex, there's allergies right. to all sorts of materials already that mm-hmm. um, we address through alternatives. I, I suppose that there will always be a demand for non-mushroom leather. And, and I don't think these folks are trying to replace leather en masse. They don't see this as a replacement for leather. They see it as something that, alongside that can help fill that demand that has traditionally been filled by leather. Related question, is this going to sprout in the rain? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, that I, would be a problem, but it'd be super funny. That would be great. <laughs> I mean, in a way, that would be a feature, not a bug. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, traditional leather also doesn't do great in the rain. So I'm not <laughs> sure that it's a, a deal breaker if this wouldn't do well in the rain either. But I think it, it might do fine. Uh, they treat this the same way mm-hmm. they treat other kinds of products, where they, they go through a tanning process where they're applying you know, preservatives and, and working with the material to make it resistant to outside factors. How much that protects it from water damage is probably no different than leather. A lot of people thought that it looked cool. People wanted to make sure we still used all parts of the cow, that we weren't just going to start throwing away leather because we were uh, shifting to this. Okay. Some people felt vegan leather, leather was already pretty good. So, um, And then people thought it was straight up vegan propaganda. Hmm. Mm. Well, I'm not a vegan, mm. so... Just well, a useful took, idiot. Yeah, yeah. yeah I just, I'm just a tool of the vegan <laughs> empire. <laughs> and um, yeah, no, I, I don't think anyone at my coworks sees this as a replacement for leather. Like, no, they're like, very, very clear about it. And, yeah. and what they're really emphasizing is that they don't even want to be really compared to it. They're like, this is a new category. Right. It's a new thing. How much is Big Mushroom paying you to say that? <laughs> <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We took down a 16-ounce ribeye yesterday. So. <laughs> I don't think we could qualify as vegan. That's like a leather jacket worth of steak. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I don't think you have to be a vegan zealot to be excited about non-meat <laughs> sources for your shoes or your coats or your other leather goods. Like, yeah. I think that um, that seems a little histrionic to me. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm... Actually, I'm a vegetarian. I don't wear leather. So, I mean, it would be appealing to me in general. But even if I did, I feel like, you know, I enjoy leather and have the opportunity to have more things that feel like it mm-hmm. more cheaply, you know, and more sustainably. Just- As part of your vegetarianness? Yeah. No, I mean, the same reasons I don't eat meat. I just don't know, also don't wear leather. But again, not, not it would be kind of weird if you, you did wear a lot of leather and you didn't eat meat. What's that? Like that would be actually kind of odd if you didn't eat meat but still wore a lot of leather. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's kind of a. How far does that extend? Did it also extend to like wool? Uh, no, because wool just you know they just share the sheep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Were there any great meme comments for this video? Oh, were there? Zero zero five. That's a time code for five seconds into this video. Nice work. You only took five seconds to make a science video inappropriate for all minors and uncomfortable for most adults. Most adults? Really? Oh, all right. <laughs> um, I, I assume they're referring to the uh, bondage material yes. joke. Yes. Well, leather is used for a lot of these kinds of products, and uh, these products are sometimes funny. So <laughs> I wasn't going to miss the opportunity to make a crass joke. Uh, I'll also say we are making these videos for people to like watch them on YouTube. And, <laughs> you know, if you really watch just like a straight lay science video on mushroom leather, there's, there's many great articles out there mm-hmm. that 
you could consume and I'm sure you'd learn a lot, but this is uh, the balance between entertainment and science. You have options. You have options. <laughs> we got a few comments to that regard, as I recall. A few people. Were oh, I have three more lined up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's let's just keep it up. Let's let's roll on to the next one. Constructive criticism. Mm. The humor significantly undercuts your otherwise professional and informative videos. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's true. It also helps retain a lot of the audience. So there's that <laughs> side of things too. <laughs> I don't like how dismissive he sounds at 145, but other than that, very interesting. I love the concept. Boss is wearing leather pants. There's the history and specificity of leather having come from an animal, so it is the trace of life. Yes, and cool, and totally rad, and awesome. I am dismissive sometimes. Well, isn't that the point of the narrator sometimes? Right, I, I think it's probably worth talking about, like, the narrator persona yeah. is, is very an intentionally unreliable narrator. <laughs> it's meant to be a, a narrator who, who is saying wrong things occasionally. Right. And we try and make that as clear as possible so that you realize this is an ironic choice we're making, that this is a persona, this is not what we as a as a company believe this is just an, uh, a persona to try and have some fun with these things. So sometimes I say things that are snarky or, or incorrect or I'll uh, sort of get in arguments with the subjects in a way that, that is fun for me and the, the editor usually. But uh, I, I don't know what people expect out of certain types of media when they're like, it's like all serious all the time. And right. Like, there's other avenues for that. Yeah, right. I mean, maybe that's an artful way of saying it. It was like, there are TED Talks on this subject. Yeah. <laughs> right. And TED Talks have a certain tone and style, and that's really great for them. I enjoy a lot of TED Talks. This show is not that. Yeah. Which <laughs> Bondage jokes are actually written into my contract. <laughs> I approved it. It's, it's there. Yeah. Well, I will say, other commenters pushed back on people making these comments. Oh, no. So this no. wasn't like... Whew. Bring forth... Our defenders. <laughs> <laughs> who, who will be our champion? Well, people just said, like, you know, grow up, for example, right. or come on, this is YouTube, you know, kind of a thing. So we're not leaving you, cutting you loose here. At least the community isn't. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah. Thanks for checking out the Hard Reset Podcast. Please like and subscribe so we can continue to share this whole series with you. Please make sure you check out the next episode of the Hard Reset Podcast on the Hard Reset series on Freethink. Next time, Hard Reset BDSM.